we are, message number three in our series, AKA, also known as. In other words, do you know the names that you are called by, that you are also known as? Yes, I have a first name as you do. My name happens to be Mark. But do I know the names that God has called me? In the Bible, there are 10 significant names that, that God calls us, and we're studying these 10 names because really, the only way you can understand who you truly are, get to know your identity, is by understanding these names. A bit ago, I came across a little article, a very interesting article. I'll read this for you. A French court has ruled... The parents of a recently born baby must pick a more suitable name for their offspring. After the baby's birth in September, the parents chose to name the child Nutella, a reference to the popular hazelnut spread, like you'll see a picture here right now. But in November, a judge intervened, citing the child's interest. The judge renamed the infant Ella after the parents failed to appear at the hearing. The judge said, a name like that, Nutella, can only lead to teasing and disparaging thoughts. And I would share with you this. The names that God has given you do not lead to teasing or disparaging thoughts, even though for some of us we have disparaging thoughts about our identity. But when you discover the meaning and the names that God has given you, it leads to positive thoughts about who you are, encouraging thoughts about who you are. And all of us need this series, but there are some of us, especially because we've been beat up by life, and maybe people have just called us names that have injured us in the past. You, you desperately need this series. You desperately need to understand the identity you have because of the names that God calls you. Proverbs 22, verse 1, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver and gold. God wants you to learn the good names that he's given you. And the principle of the whole series is this. My true identity is not found in the names given to me by my parents. It's not found in that name given to you by your parents, but it's found in the names given to me by God. Your identity, it's already been given to you by God. You just have to discover it. God is the identity revealer, and the Bible is, is, is the identity provider. And in, we will, we're, so far, we've, uh, we've studied two of our ten names, haven't we, if you've been with us. The first name is what? Saint. So I'm Mark, but I'm also Saint Mark. There's Saint Jim and Saint Kathy. The second name is Child of God. So there's Jim, Child of God, and it's the same with you. This morning, we're going to study uh, the third name. It's more of a down-to-earth name, a real name, even a humorous name that's kind of given to us by God. And as you would know, it's the name Sheep. Sheep. Yes, I'm Mark, but I'm also the Lord's Sheep. So I'd like you to turn to your neighbor right now and give him your first name and say, Hi, I'm this, but I'm also known as... Just go for it. Go for it. Come on. Go for it. I really pray that Pastor Larry does not walk in right now. Or a guest, you know. But what you've done right now is you've just voiced or actually bleated part of your true identity. You really have. A key principle, you see, for learning your true identity is to begin talking about yourself the way God talks about you and sometimes voicing, you know, bleeding the way that, you know, a sheep is because you've got to understand that as you look in the mirror, do you see yourself as a sheep? You should because that's how God sees you. So when you wake up tomorrow morning, you look in the mirror, and uh, you, know, you look at yourself, uh, say, good morning, Mark, and then you may want to go, <laughs> you know? And so your children and your wife or husband and your neighbors might start hearing you that way. And when they ask you what you're doing, just say, hey, I'm just trying to come to terms with tr who I truly am. Okay, and please do not answer the phone at work by bleeding tomorrow. 
I don't want any of you losing your jobs or anything like that. But at any rate, you get the point. So where are we going this morning? This is what we're going to do this morning. Because you and I are God's sheep, there are three things that are true about us that we need to embrace as part of our identity. Because this is who we are as a sheep. This is who God sees us. There are three, three things that are true. Number one is this. Because I am God's sheep, I tend to wander. Can you repeat that after me? I tend to wander. Isn't that the case? I mean, I grew up on a ranch, okay? And we had chores. Part of my chores were, was shepherding. We had sheep. And I can tell you, sheep wander. If there is a hole in the fence, they will find it. And they're off. They drift. They get into all sorts of trouble. I remember one time I was walking the fence line. And I come to the top of our 90 acres, and there's a spring there, and there's a sheep in that spring caught up to its belly, literally in mud. And it's just sitting there in its belly, all fours down, and it can't move. It's been stuck there. I have no idea how long. And it's just looking at me. And it's just like, what's up, dude? You going to help me or not? You know? And I'm like, you idiot! You know? <laughs> it's like, ah, isn't that like us? We get up belly high in mud at times because we wander. You know, I came across another interesting little story here. Let me just read this, and then, Robert, you put up the picture when you feel it's the appropriate time. Even the most interesting man in the world couldn't get an unidentified driver in Tacoma, Washington out of a fine. A state trooper pulled over the motorist on March 23rd and issued to him a $124 fine for driving in a high-occupancy vehicle lane without a passenger. Instead, the driver had seat-belted a, a cutout of the actor who portrays the most interesting man in the world from the Dos Equis, Dos Equis beer commercials into the passenger seat. The trooper allowed the man to keep the cutout, but fined him $124. I'm like, this is what we do. We do stupid things like this. Because we're sheep. And then here, look, look at this cartoon. I came across this cartoon. Wait a minute. I used to distinctly remember ignoring this same sermon two years ago. <laughs> this is what we do because we're sheep. We ignore the word of God at times. We wander. We get into mud. We do things, traffic violence. All these things are just because we are sheep. Isaiah 53, verse 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. That's God's description of how he sees us and really who we are. Like the old hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. There are some that are not here with us this morning because this week they chose to just wander and drift from the God that loves them so very much. We've all been there. Jonah wandered. Remember, God said, go to, that great, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Oh, isn't that like us? We wander, sometimes running from God. A little girl was talking to her teacher about whales, since we're talking about Jonah. And the teacher said, it was physically impossible for a whale to swallow a human. The little girl stated that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. Irritated, the teacher reiterated that a whale could not swallow a human. It was physically impossible. The little girl said, when I get to heaven, I will ask Jonah. The teacher asked, what if Jonah went to hell? The little girl replied, then you ask him. <laughs> Why do I share that? Don't mess with little girls. Don't mess with little girls. Has nothing to do with the message. I just thought that was good. But we wander, don't we all? That, that we're, we're sheep. Turn to your neighbor and go, bah, you just wander. You know, that, that's what we do. Abraham wandered. You know, I think like home communities are watching this right now. Can you imagine? I bet you guys are having a lot of fun right now. <laughs> Abraham wandered. For a while he stayed in Gerar, and there Abraham said of his wife, Sarah, oh, she's my sister. We wander into lying, don't we? Mm. David wandered. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. 
The woman was very beautiful. She came to him and he slept with her. We wander into adultery or sexual immorality because we're sheep. Peter wandered. Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I'll never disown you, Jesus. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, but he denied it. I don't know what you're talking about. We wander into denying Jesus. Wow. Paul wandered. Paul said this. Have you ever said something like this? I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Wow. Do you know what Jonah and Abraham and David and Peter and Paul and all of us have in common? We are all sheep. The Lord calls us sheep. This is part of our identity. You have to realize when you look in the mirror that you are prone to wander. If you do not understand that, you are in a world of trouble. Because we're going to talk about how mature sheep should grow in their understanding. Yes, they are prone to wander. There's other things, but you need to understand this about your identity. This isn't an excuse, but it is an explanation for our behavior. This isn't permission to wander, but it is an explanation as to why we wander. It's our nature. Now, here's the great thing. God understands this, this about us. He understands that we're a sheep. He created us this way. He understands that we have this tendency to wander. Psalm 100, verse 3, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. God, God made us. He understands everything about your wandering tendencies. Psalm 103, verse 14, For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Because I am the Lord's sheep, I tend to wander. This is an important fact to understand about your identity. So when you look in the mirror, yes, you are a saint. You are a child of God, but you are also a sheep who tends to wander. I don't know if you've ever really thought about that. That's how God sees you. I like you to talk about this at your tables. How do you find yourself like a sheep who at times wanders? Talk about that at your tables. Go for it. So who am I? I am the Lord's sheep. And because I am the Lord's sheep, I tend to wander. But the second is this. Because I am the Lord's sheep, I have a shepherd who constantly cares for me. If we didn't have a shepherd who constantly cares for us and all we did was wander, wow, would we be in a world of trouble. I don't know if you've ever thought really deeply about the care that your shepherd shows you and your shepherd is Jesus because you are his sheep. And we're going to study that right now. And it is amazing. It really is. The care that you receive is just, it's staggering when I study it. How much your shepherd loves you is incredible. I was a decent shepherd, you know, when I grew up on the ranch, but I was a teenager. I got distracted. I had homework. I was into sports. I'd rush out there, you know, on the hillside to help, you know, shepherd those sheep or whatever. But there is no comparison to me or any human shepherd compared to the shepherd of Jesus and the care that he gives you because you are his sheep. It's incredible. Hebrews 13.20 describes it this way. Our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep. Would you just underline in your outline that great shepherd? You have not just a shepherd. He is a great shepherd of your life. You say, how? I want to give you 10 ways. I could give you 20 but I want to give you 10 ways that Jesus cares for you, his sheep. 10 ways that he is a great shepherd over your life. And you just need to stand back and look in the mirror and say, wow, I'm a sheep, I tend to wander. But thank you, Jesus, that you care for me in these ways because it is remarkable. Number one, and I'm going to put these in the first person to make them more personal. He rescued me and brought me into his flock. Now, you need to think about the time when you were not his sheep and you were wandering in darkness and on that hillside 
and being ravaged by the wolves of this world. If we had some of you come up here and talk about your life before you had that shepherd, wow, he rescued you from that pit, so to speak. Think that's how he cared for you. He initiated the rescue. You think about it and saved you by his grace. Now you say, how did Jesus rescue me and bring me into his flock? Well, I need to finish that story about that sheep stuck in the mud. When I came up and saw that sheep near the spring, sunk in the mud up to its belly, and he, he was immovable, unable to save himself. And I, I remember I just went, are you kidding me? It was like I would have to walk all the way back down the hill, get the tractor and a rope, and I'm like, I don't want to walk all the way down the hill, come all the way up, and I'm just looking at this guy. I'm like, are you serious? I'm a terrible shepherd. I had a bad attitude, you know? And I'm telling you, this sheep was there for a while because there was urine and there was feces and it was muddy. And I'm like, and I got down, I mean, I'm sinking down with him and I just started with my hands digging mud, pulling it out and got my hands finally around the torso of this, started pulling with all my might and he just sink back in. Then I had to dig so deep, I got his legs out, and I am covered in, in mud. It's disgusting, and I am sweating. I kid you not, it took me over an hour. I was sweating. It was one of the hardest times I've ever worked in my life. I was upset, <laughs> and I'm, I was angry and yet compassionate for this sheep, and I mean I was drenched in filth and in sweat, and, and finally I got that sheep out, and I mean I just laid down here, and I remember in the mud looking straight up, and, and I'm honest, I started thinking about Jesus, and I started thinking about what Jesus did for me to get me out of where I was. I started thinking about the cross and about my shepherd who paid the ultimate price, who got bloody. That's how much your shepherd loves you and cares for you. And with that in mind, I don't want you to turn there. I want you to look at Jesus and let me read how he is described Surely he took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we were healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Wow. You see, Jesus, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this, he serves as both the sacrificial lamb and the good shepherd who rescued you from the doom of separation from God for all eternity and he brought you into his flock. John 1.29 says this. It's on your outlines. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There, Jesus is the Lamb of God. John 10, I am the good shepherd. Here he's pictured as the shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. There shall be one flock and one shepherd. In order there to be a flock, the shepherd and the lamb had to be crucified so that you could come into that flock. That's how much Jesus, your shepherd, and the Lamb of God loves you. Both of Jesus' roles as sheep and shepherd are summarized in 1 Peter chapter 2. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. There's the Lamb of God. So that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseers of your souls. So the first way that Jesus cares for us as a sheep, a sheep who wanders, <laughs> is he sacrificed his life for us. He cared for us so deeply, he saved us from our sins so that we could be brought into his flock, so we could be saints and children of God and sheep of his fold. That's an amazing thing. Second way Jesus cares for us, he's my personal shepherd. Now, if you have your Bibles and you want to flip there to Psalm 23, this is the most famous, probably passage in all the Bible, next to John 
It was penned by David in the hills of Judea as he's thinking and pondering about God being a shepherd. And I don't know if you've ever seen how the psalm begins. The Lord is my shepherd. So, you know, there's times I think we look in the mirror and we think I'm unworthy because I wander so much. You know, yes, God, you're Pastor Mark Shepherd, you're Pastor Larry Shepherd, but you're not my shepherd. You don't care about me. Nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus is your personal shepherd. You have a personal shepherd. He is known as Jesus Christ. You need to see yourself that way. Yes, you are his sheep. He is not ashamed to call you his sheep. He is your shepherd, personal, my shepherd. Thirdly, he cares for my needs. Look at Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Why is it that we should not be in want? Because we have a shepherd that cares for our needs. What are the needs he cares for? And then he lists them. Well, he makes me lie down in green pastures. There's times we need rest, and he brings us rest. He leads me beside quiet waters and restores my soul. Sometimes we need to be replenished, and he restores our soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Sometimes we need guidance, and he provides it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. There's times that we need his presence, and he sends it. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There's times we need God's comfort and his protection, and, and he provides that. And if that weren't enough, he goes way beyond just meeting our needs, even to our wants and our dreams and our greatest desires. Verse 5 and 6, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Wow, that's amazing. All of our needs and beyond. Oh, he cares. How else does Jesus care? as our shepherd. Four, he searches for me. We wander, don't we? Even as believers, we wander. Ezekiel 34, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them. And Ezekiel 34 is contrasting the false shepherds of Israel with the good shepherd God, and the good shepherd searches for his sheep. If you've never read Matthew 18, this is such a beautiful picture. I think we've all had this experience before. If you've never thought about it, you have. Jesus talks, I just, just listen, Matthew 18, verse 12. But what do you think? I mean, Jesus is saying, think about this. If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one that's wandered off? Sometimes this has been us. We've wandered off and the Lord found us. And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. You see, the Lord is so good, we wander, but he he finds us. He seeks us out because we belong to him. And also, he rescues us. Ezekiel 34, verse 12, I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. All of us have had days of clouds and darkness. And yet the Lord in his grace, think of those times. He's rescued you from that pit of emotional despair You're so deep, and yet he's there, his presence, his rescuing power. He also pastures me, Ezekiel 34. I will pasture them on the mountains in Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture. There they will lie down in a great, good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture. Think of the spiritual feeding you get. I'm not trying to lift up, you know, our church necessarily, Here you are, you're grazing right now. You're being fed the word of God. You just came from a main service or you will go into a main service where the word of God is taught to you week in and week out. That's the good shepherd coming to you. That's not Pastor Mark or Pastor Larry. That's the good shepherd in us coming to you, feeding you because he loves you. And you have to look at yourself and realize you're special to the Lord. He cares for you. He also strengthens me, Ezekiel 34. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. When you've been injured, when you've needed strength, think of the times the Lord comes to you. Sometimes he comes through a friend to you or ministry at this church or himself directly. Why? Because you're his sheep. He strengthens. He also knows me, number eight. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. 
just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Think of how deeply Jesus and the Father know each other. Think about that. That is how deeply Jesus, your shepherd, knows you. As the Father knows the Son, so does the Son know you. That is incredible. See, Jesus knows everything about you. He is your personal shepherd. He knows everything about your life. He loves you. He cares for you that deeply. And also, he leads me. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Wow. How else does he care for us? Number 10, he secures me eternally. John 10, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Wow. You know, I, I, I picked up another article here about a, a guy, an American, who grew up in the city, and, and he wanted to discover what it would be like to just be a shepherd. So he traveled all the way to Africa, and uh, I think in Tanzania, I'm not sure what, which country it is, but uh, he, he lived as a shepherd for three months, and he writes this article. I want, just listen to what it's like to be a shepherd. A day out with the sheep usually looks like this. We get up at 5.30 a.m. and go out to count the sheep to be sure none ran away or were stolen in the night. After that, we gather in one of the huts and cook breakfast. We usually finish cooking and eating at 7 a.m. and then head out on the mountaintops then. From our hut, we often hike between one and three kilometers to where we plan to graze the animals for the day. This takes anywhere between one and three hours once we reach uh, about there at 10.30. The sheep are tired of walking, and they lay low for a while. At about 2 p.m., we turn the animals around, and they usually know the way home. So it is a matter of walking, sitting, walking, sitting, and walking behind them until we are near the cattle post again. Once we reach 5 o'clock p.m., we go back to our huts and start cooking dinner. At about 6.30 p.m., we go out and count the sheep to be sure none of them ran off during the day. I listen to that and I go, this is the care that men give for sheep. And I think it's nothing in comparison, even though it's tender and beautiful, to this shepherding that Jesus gives you, which is 24-7. His eyes are never off you. When you look in the mirror, do you see yourself as a sheep that Jesus loves so much? He gave his life for you. He's with you all the time. He knows you wander. He gets it. He loves you in spite of that. Please accept his love. Some of you are barely here because you feel so guilty or, or just be, because of what's happened. No, there's a God that loves you has so much compassion on you, and he wants you to look in the mirror and see him as your shepherd, a shepherd that loves you so much, and just at times, don't you love the pictures? Have you ever seen it of a sheep on a shepherd's, and he just, there's times he carries us, and he loves us. Man. Hmm, is that your identity? Yes, we wander, but we're God's sheep, the sheep of Jesus, and he cares for us constantly. I'd like you to talk about that. What aspect of Jesus' care for you are you most grateful for? Take a moment and talk about that. Because I am the Lord's sheep, I tend to wander. But because I'm also the Lord's sheep, I have a shepherd, his name is Jesus, who really cares for me in amazing ways, 24-7. The third thing is this, because I'm the Lord's sheep, I need to stay close to the shepherd and to the flock. You see, the times we really get into trouble in our lives is when we drift from the shepherd and from the flock. Because I am the Lord's sheep, I tend to wander, you know, that's kind of my natural instinctive behavior, but there's a shepherd, you see, and he wants to care for me. And I have to realize that it's so important about who I am as I see myself, I need to understand that tendency. And probably one of the things that most breaks my heart is when I see God's sheep get hurt for one reason or another, sometimes it's with other sheep, and all of a sudden they pull away from the shepherd, Jesus, 
and then they pull away from the flock, the church, and it breaks my heart. Because those are the times you need to draw near to the shepherd and near to the flock. We have to realize this about ourselves. I am the Lord's sheep. I tend to wander. I have a shepherd who cares for me. And I have a flock that cares for me. And I need to stay close to that shepherd and close to that flock. Now, remember that sheep that I found on its belly up to its, you know, in the mud. It was nowhere. It was miles away from the flock. It was nowhere near the shepherd. It was isolated, and it got into so much trouble. It almost lost its life. I mean, if I would not have been walking in that direction up there, that sheep would be dead, you know. Yes, we have this tendency to wander, but it's never God's plan for us to wander from the shepherd, Jesus, nor is it God's plan for us to wander from the church, That's the type of wandering we must always avoid at any cost. Now, listen to Jesus' instruction to a sheep. He says this in John 10. It's on your outlines. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Now, you need to understand that you are eternally protected from the enemy and sin and this world, and you're, you're protected by God. But there is eternally, but there is a true enemy. He's known as Satan. And he has the goal to steal, kill, and destroy. And he, and he's, he, he does that at times, physically, emotionally, marriages, and the family. And these are, he wrecks havoc, especially when we get away from the shepherd. We get away from the church. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come, Jesus said, that they, you'd have life to the full. I am the good shepherd. I have other sheep who are not of this pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock, that's speaking of the church, and one shepherd, that's Jesus. We need to stay close to the shepherd, Jesus, and to his flock, the church. Why? Because Jesus, our shepherd, and the church, the flock, are our source of care. You know, years ago, uh, I went, uh, I've gone a couple times hunting with my brother Todd. I'm not like the hunter in the family Todd is. Todd is an amazing hunter. He lives in Montana, and to just keep up with this guy um, is next to just about impossible when he's hunting. He knows how to hunt. I just tag along. But I remember one year we were hunting for elk. You hunt for elk early in the morning or late kind of in the evening. Um, before sundown. And anyway, during the day, you just kind of lay low. The elk are so smart, there's no way you're going to be able to hunt them during the day. So, but antelope are not as smart. And so we would get in his truck and we'd just go through the pastures. You know, this is just out in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness in Montana and, and look for antelope. And sure enough, we come across one, when they're in herds, it's really hard to even get close to them. But when they're, we, we found one antelope and it was, we just parked the car. Todd goes, I'm going out. I go, there's no way you're going to get near that antelope. And it was a buck antelope. It had antlers. It was just sitting in the middle of this huge field, a green field, and just sitting there. And, and I'm like, and when we're, we're hunting with bow and arrows, okay? This is man's way to hunt. And Todd gets out with his bow, and he's, uh, you know, he's, he gets within, I could not, I'm watching the whole thing, you know, from the truck. And uh, he gets within 30 yards of this antelope draws back, and Todd's an amazing shot, right through the heart. Thing got up, ran like three steps, and that was it. And uh, literally that night, by the way, we ate antelope. It was hot meat on the grill. It It was wild, man, okay? My point for you is this, though. That antelope was picked off so easily. He was having a bad day. It must have been. I'm like, he was... There, he had no one around him, no shepherd, no other antelope to give warning or anything, and it was easy pickings for a skilled hunter like my brother. Guess what? There's even a more skilled hunter. He's known as Satan and his demons. And we're just easy prey. Now, we're protected eternally, but let me tell you, if you're not close to Jesus, your shepherd, and staying close to your church, the flock... You're setting yourself up. And that is something we need to understand about our identity. Now, I want you to think a little bit 
Have you ever thought about what it's like to be a pastor? I just want to kind of drop myself, my guard a little bit and let you know it, it is, I remember the day I was ordained, man, my legs were shaking. To be a pastor who shepherds God's people is an unbelievable call. And I need to share with you, it's with fear and trembling every Sunday I come here. It is holy fear that I view this position that I am in. You need to understand that. I do not take, even though I've been in ministry now 30 plus years, I do not take my role lightly. You know what the Bible says? It says this, keep, this is what Jesus says to me as a pastor. Mark, keep watch over yourselves. You watch yourself first. You shepherd your own life first. That's why on a Saturday night, I'm at home praying for you. I'm praying for my own soul. I never go out on a Saturday. Typically, Larry and I just don't. Other guys probably can, but for my soul and, and for you, you deserve me at my best. I'm not talking about some works, righteousness. I just need to be focused on being able to be the best pastor I can be for you. And that's Larry and I, that's all of our staff, I believe. I really, we have an amazing pastoral staff. You watch yourselves and all the flock. There are a lot of people in our church a lot, and a lot of people, even in home builders, they're like over 400 that come here on a regular basis, which the Holy Spirit has made me an overseer, a pastor of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. When I look at that picture of Jesus, he purchased you. He died for you, and I'm called to shepherd you, and let me tell you, it is a humbling thing, and it brings me to my knees all the time. Now, I want you to know something. Um, I believe one of the most important ways I can shepherd you is by giving you every single Sunday the best I can in the teaching of God's word, a healthy meal served to where you can understand God's word, food, sustenance for your life. I believe that's not the only thing I do. I do many other things than that. But I'm telling you, I study as hard as I can with the Lord, listening to him, so I can give you the greatest meal that I'm able to give, humanly speaking, through the supernatural preaching of God's word. Okay? Now, not, not, and thank you. I, I know you guys are appreciative of that. Here's the greatest way you can show your appreciation. Be here. I cannot pastor you. I cannot shepherd you if you're not here. Okay, and this isn't, this is, I'm, I want this to come across as love. So that when you look in the mirror and you go, I tend to wander. I have a shepherd, who, Jesus, who cares for me. But guess what? The only way he can really care for you is if you get in a rhythm as a sheep by not being away from the shepherd or the flock and that you're here. I'm not saying there aren't times to be away. Don't get me wrong. This is not legalism. I just know there are people right now my heart breaks for that are not here. They're away from the sheep. They're away from the shepherd, Jesus, and they're away from our flock. And I know they're going through it. And, and I feel for that. My point is, I'm called to shepherd you. But it, it's really a challenge to shepherd someone who's not there. And I thank God that you're here this morning. And I just want to continue to encourage you to be here and pray for me that I could continue to shepherd you and, and teach the Word of God in a way that's going to connect. And I think about you guys. I look around here. Some of you are brand new sheep. Others of you are sheep. Man, you, you, you've been a, man, you're a sheep for a long time. It's like this morning at 4 a.m. There's a dog barking, okay? I didn't hear it because I wear it like earplugs. Tracy heard this dog. I get up at 6 a.m. this morning, a little before that, and uh, I take my earplugs out, and I'm hearing this really weird noise. I'm like, Trace, what's that noise? And she goes, I think it's a dog. I'm like, how long has it been barking? She goes, well, at least two hours. I go, you've been up for two hours? How come you didn't wake me? Well, I didn't want to wake you, and she's just listening to this dog bark. I mean, this dog was just like, it was the weirdest. Arr, arr. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, okay, as soon as it gets light, I'm going to go up there and look for this dog. So I, go, I, I, I bought my cell phone. I thought, man, this will be interesting. I want to see what this thing is. So we get up there, and it's just like this, awesome lab, but it's an old lab. I mean, this, he's like looking at me going, <laughs> this pathetic, some of you are old sheep. 
Some of you are new sheep. You're all beautiful sheep. But I think about this. I go, man, how's that old sheep going to understand this message? You've got to have something even deeper for them. How's that brand new sheep? They're just a you know, yearling. How are they going to relate to this? These are the things pastors think about. Why? Because the shepherd's heart of Jesus is in us, and it makes us love you. I love you guys. Um, and I, I don't think there's a pastor that doesn't have the heart of Jesus that doesn't love his people. I'd do anything for you. Now, I say that, and I go, Lord, you, but at the same time, I'm not the perfect shepherd, because think of how I treated that sheep that was stuck in mud, man. I was yelling at it. I was upset. You know, so I'm not Jesus, but I'm just saying, you need the care of a shepherd. You got to stay close to him, okay? Look at this verse here in 1 Peter 2.25. It says this, for you were like sheep going astray. This is pointing out there are two categories of sheep, and I'm going to ask you, which are you? You were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You were like this, a young sheep, an immature sheep. You were going astray. Some of you right now, you're struggling. You've got a real pattern of going astray from the shepherd. It might be a week or two before you talk to Jesus. I don't know. Or, you know, you're in church one week and then the next week you're not or whatever. But others of you, you've learned I'm going to stay close to that shepherd, Jesus. I'm going to stay close to his flock. You're a mature sheep. You're here. Not just here, but you're walking with the shepherd, Jesus. And you're with his flock. And that takes different looks. That is maturity. And that's a great thing in your life. Because that's telling me you see yourself the way God sees you. I am a sheep. I tend to wander. I have an awesome shepherd that cares for me. I need to stay close to the shepherd and close to the flock. Wow, you get that in your identity? That's a great moment. Talk about this in your life. Why is it important to stay close to the shepherd and to the flock? Talk about that. Some of you can really speak into that and give a great answer. I'd like you to talk at your tables. All right, well, hey, this morning we've looked at the third, the third of ten different names given to us by God that forms our identity. Also known as, who am I also known as? Yes, I'm Mark, but I'm also known as Saint, Child of God, and Bah. That's right, you got it. And basically, as you look at yourself, and again, I've challenged you through this series, I hope you've done it. You put them near where you get up in the morning, put on your makeup, whatever, shave. Put them on if you need to and say, ah, good morning, Mark. Bah. I am a sheep. Look at yourself. I am a sheep. And because I'm a sheep, you've got to say this to yourself and God. Lord, I wander. But I thank you, Jesus, that you care for me all the time. But I need to stay near you the shepherd, and near the flock to receive that care. So help me to do that, Lord. What a great way to begin this week if you would do that Monday through Saturday and then you're here next Sunday. What a great week that will be. I want you to learn, and I'm so grateful. Right now, you learn those first three names. That is so cool. You knew. Saint, child of God, and sheep. That's fantastic. Keep seeing yourself the way God sees you, talking to yourself the way God talks about you, it'll make such a difference in your life spiritually. And then tomorrow morning when you look in the mirror, also the last thing you do before you walk out, say, Lord, thank you so much for not naming me Nutella. (laughs) Let's pray.